everyone. Welcome to the Women Are Worthy show. Okay. I'm excited. I'm excited. Well, I started this journey where I wanted people to just get a slice of who Jackie Charles is. People are constantly telling me, Jackie, you're happy. You're always smiling. What's going on with you? Are you taking something? I'm like, yep. I'm taking some Jesus juice, okay? So I wanted people to understand and meet some of the people in my life that have helped me being spiritual on that journey, my mental abilities, because I'm telling you, in today's world, things are just crazy. So we want to welcome you to my world or our world. So here's another person. Last week, we had Pastor Mike Lynch. Today, I want you to meet someone who means so much to me. And I think he's going to turn red because he doesn't know anything I'm about to say. And I've not told him, okay? So Reverend Richard Burdick, he is the Reverend at Unity North Atlanta. It's located at 4255 Sandy Plains Road in Marietta, Georgia, East Cobb. Now, let me tell you a story that I didn't share with him. So someone reached out to me and says, Jackie, I know you're looking for a spiritual center or a church. Come on down to Unity North. I'm like, Unity who? They're like, Unity North. We have this guy. He's unconventional. He's just all about loving the world. And when he talks, he is something else. I'm like, yeah, I heard this before because this was at a time when I was searching, you know, this is before I found Mike and all that. I was searching. So I said, okay, what the heck? So I go to Unity North and y'all, can I tell you, I was pleasantly surprised. First of all, they didn't have me in the church for six hours. And you guys know how I feel about being in the church for six hours. <laughs> and he gets straight to the point. So I see this guy comes up. He's charismatic. He sings. He plays the piano. There isn't anything this guy doesn't do. But most importantly, what I love about Unity North, we do meditation. We love one another. We accept if you're a rabbi or if you're Jewish, if you're, it doesn't matter. We welcome everyone. When I first went, I was welcomed. People didn't ask like, what do you do for a living? They didn't ask any of those questions. They just wanted to know, do you like being here? How can we help you? This is the next service. These are the things we have on the calendar. And y'all, can I tell you, they didn't pass the collection plate around 50 million times, okay? It wasn't like that. But I can see the love that the people had for the church and the love that they had for their Reverend Richard Burdick. So, you know, he's out there and I'm watching him and I'm like, Oh man, no, this is probably just a show for me. So Richard, I want to welcome you to the Women Are Worthy show. This is long overdue, but I want it to be the right time. Today's show, I wanted people to understand what we're doing in this pandemic because I call this show pandemic plus panic equals prayer. And you are one of the best people that I know to come on the show to talk about this because you've helped me through a lot of things. You're rapping with the Rev, which I love. So the Women Are Worthy show, we welcome Reverend Richard Burdick. How are you? I am fantastic, and I'm delighted to be here. It is a long time overdue. I've been wanting to be on your show. You have such wonderful guests, and you have the heart of an angel. And to be in your presence and to be in your spirit and to be in this dialogue is the greatest blessing of, of my day today. So thank you for inviting me into your space. Well, you know, I have to give him credit. Guys, do you see this calmness that you're seeing and the things that you guys say that you like? I have to give credit to, you know, Reverend Richard and also Mike for this, okay? Because I'm telling you, this was a work in progress and they somehow by their messages and what they're doing has made me feel more spiritually connected with the, my higher power, God, the universe, and people. So it's important that you take credit for where credit is due. Nobody can do the work but you, and you've put the work in, you've put the effort in, and you've discovered the truth about yourself. All we did was create an arena for you to remember the truth of who you are. See why I love this guy? Okay, so Richard, let's talk about Unity North. Why is Unity North so special? Well, you know, special is kind of an interesting word. All spiritual centers have their own unique flavor and their unique ability to reach people in their own way. I, I would say that we're special because Unity North has made a strong commitment to building bridges of understanding. We're working really hard to tear down the walls of theology, the walls of differences, and to celebrate our differences as a portal through which we find our unity, our oneness. We belong to each other. Science has shown us that we're 99.9% .9 made up of the same stuff. 
And the unity philosophy is saying that spiritually we are the same stuff, that there is no you and me, us and them. We all belong to each other, as Rumi would say it. We're all walking each other home to that truth that we have forgotten as a human race. I need you to speak to the people, including myself, because right now we have a lot of racial tension going on. We have the pandemic. We have parents who are cooped up in the house with their children and their tolerance, their patience is very low right now. I want someone who's watching. Can you offer some wisdom, some tips? What can you offer people? Because some people are at their wits end and I'm constantly hearing that. So I told them, okay, we'll do the show. I'll send it to you. What can you offer right now? Because for some, they're thinking it's revelation. The world is ending and they're going overboard. What advice can you give us to help us through this? Well, I like the words you use, revelation. You know, energy teaches us that life is consciousness. And whatever happens to be happening in our lives individually and collectively, is a symbol of what's going on internally in the consciousness individually and collectively. And so we can look at what's happening in the world, and it is, it's painful, it's difficult, there's violence. And at that point, it's exposing that which is residing in the mind of the human race. And I'm going to call it good because it's coming up to be released. That which is toxic within the environment of our own hearts and our relationships with each other in our differences is coming up to be healed. And how that healing manifests in our life is going to be dependent on whether we fight it, we push against it, we run from it, or we sit in the fire and allow the entire human race and our own mind to be purified. So what's happening is the exposing, and we call it God if you want, it's just a natural evolutionary process that we're all involved in to come face to face with that which we need to look at. Not to run to try and hide it, not to fight against it, but to say, where can I learn here? Where can I become more of myself here? Where can we remember that which we have forgotten as we're making our way back to the Garden of Eden that we were created in and as? And so the consciousness that we bring to it, the thoughts that we're holding, the words that we're speaking and the feelings that we allow access to our heart are determining whether this is hell or heaven. Unity says you know, that heaven and hell are just states of consciousness. And so what is the state of consciousness that you're bringing to the world as we see it today? And it will determine your experience as hellish or heaven. There are very hellish human experiences happening right now, and they are painful. But birth, and ask anybody who's ever given birth to a child, you know, it's not necessarily always easy. But on the other side of this, if we can remain diligent and constant to that which is wanting to be birthed through us, there's something really good on the other side. Just don't go to sleep. Wow. What drew you to unity? Well, the religion, as I experienced it as a young man, was very divisive. And it was the rights, the wrongs, the ones going to heaven and the ones going to hell. And what drew me to unity was the first time I was introduced that every religion on the planet had a little nugget of truth. Everybody was finding their way home, a different path. We say many times in unity, there are many paths to the one God, and we're all finding our way home. And unity allowed me to be friends with Muslims, with Jews, with Buddhists, with Hindus, and even with atheists, because there's a universal sense of kindness and compassion and love that is in all of those. So we have Christian brothers and sisters that come to unity, and they sit alongside Muslim and Jewish and Buddhist seekers. And what I saw was a possibility that the divisiveness of the world and religion as we know it today was a thing of the past and that we could come together in an outward understanding that we're all seeking the same thing. Pam, if you're in Atlanta or you're in Georgia, you got to come visit Unity North. We have monks that come to Unity North that we host. We host, so I'm going to tell you what happened. You know, I'm not trying to steal Richard Shine, but I'm going to tell you what we do. We also have women who, if they're seeking shelter, I mean, they do a host of so many things. We do the Mandela drawings. I'm telling you, this place is just, do you see how excited I am? I promise you, I didn't drink any rocket drinks or anything, but this is just how I feel when I'm talking about Unity North. I'm so excited about it. Okay. This is what I'll say, Richard. You and what God has put into you feeds my soul. Okay, I'm telling you this now. No mistake, we feed each other. You bring a light 
that is necessary to the whole. I bring a light and somehow the world's a brighter place because we're all bringing our light, our perspective. And that's what I love because it's not just me, it's not just her, it's us coming together. And I like the fact that we have a pause ministry where you can bring your dog in, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's just so cool because dogs are part of our family. So I just love that you do that. So my question is to you now, what does peace mean to you? Well, you know, I can answer from my perspective and I can offer ways that I find peace. Really, in a nutshell, Reader's Digest version is peace is the complete understanding that I cannot be separate from the presence of God. That no matter what is going on in my environment or even in my own mind, that I cannot and will not ever be separate from that I was created in and as. That means that the presence of God is always, always right smack dab in the center. And if I'm not experiencing it, well, I'm the one who's moved. So I'm one thought, I'm one look, I'm one prayer, I'm one meditation, I'm one moment or heartbeat away from the revelation that, oh, surely God was here the whole time. You know, Jacob, I believe, wakes up from sleep in the Older Testament and he says, oh, surely God was here and I didn't know it. And the reality is that's what we're all doing. We are waking up from the illusion, the dream, the sleep of the belief in separation. And then in that moment of waking up, peace emerges a peace that says i'm going to be okay because if god is for me nothing can be against me and the god is expressing at the point of all creation so in no place i can be there is no less god to be realized to be experienced and to be expressed so that peace is that that deep truth being revealed in my mind and my heart and my life what books are you currently reading right now richard <laughs> you know it's so funny you asked that question Because during this time, you think, oh, he's got all kinds of extra time to be reading books and to do, you know, sitting at home. I am busier than I've ever been. There's a lot of books sitting on the nightstand right now. And I find that, you know, what I'm doing is I'm going to some of the old standbys, the old things like the four agreements, that Mm -hmm. they're simple, simple little books. But if you could live the words in that simple little book, everything would be okay. So as a minister, I still have really difficult moments and there's lots up in the world. We've had deaths during the pandemic and I've done memorial services on a Zoom call. This is a new experience for me because I'm a touchy-feely kind of person and I like to be in the presence. Uh, Things have gotten really, really busy and I find, well, the Bible is going to be a great place to go. The Bhagavad Gita is going to be a great place to go. I've been reading a lot with my Baha'i friends and finding a great deal of peace and comfort in the midst of it with the Baha'i readings from Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. And so they're beautiful poetry that is rich and steeped with truth. And so my friend Araj and I, we often gather for the week and we just read Baha'i scriptures and I'm finding the most comfort there. Who inspires you and what inspires you? Well, I'll start with Jackie Charles inspires me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> for a number of reasons. And I think that ins- inspiration can be found everywhere. So if I make a decision in the morning that I'm going to be inspired by whoever comes into my field, I will be inspired. The people that are taking a stance for truth right now, and there's thousands of people that are speaking out in courage and putting themselves actually in danger to speak truth. Anybody who's speaking truth, they're my heroes. And they inspire me and they give me the courage. They lead the way for me to have the courage to say what needs to be said, to do it in love, but to let strength and love be partners. And so as I express my truth and I express what needs to be called out, see, we're all part of a great evolutionary process. And so when I see others with the ability to let love and strength, to stand in the fire and say, this needs to be exposed so that we can be better on the other side. Anybody who's doing that, inspires me. What does Black Lives Matter mean to you? Black Lives Matter means exactly what it is, that people of color are valuable and worthy, no less so than anybody else on the planet. I've taken a stance that Black Lives Matter, and I have some people that have come across me that really don't like that, and they always come back with All Lives Matter, which I have could have found offensive. I, I love them anyway. But an analogy that was used at one point that really, really touched my heart was I have a neighbor and my neighbor is a black neighbor and their house is on fire. And the fire department comes into the neighborhood to put out the fire at my neighbor's house. I would certainly not say, well, what about my house? Why aren't you coming to my house? Well, because my house is not on fire. The reality is black lives matter. And for too long in our history as a nation, 
And as a people, black people have been subjugated to my white privilege, to my life of luxury or ease and comfort. And I think it's absolutely time in the history of the world for us to put a light on these beautiful, magnificent people who are very much a part of my family who have been relegated to the side. And so when a light is put out or murdered, and there has been murder since the beginning of time of black people, and we've gotten away with it. And when I say black lives matter, it means no longer will I stand mute and silent when this is happening, whether it be at the hand of a police officer or the hand of bigotry or racism in any shape or form, I must put a light on that. And one way I can do that is to stand proudly with my black brothers and sisters and say, you matter, you're valuable to me. And I will give you my attention. I will give you my love. I will do whatever it takes that the world can wake up from the dream that you are less than. Okay. So that's from your perspective. And I love that. What do we do to stamp out this hate? And I'm not just talking about just black lives matter. I'm, you know, people are killing Muslims and things like that. What do we do? You know, it just pains me sometimes that people just hate people for no apparent reason because their father or their mother, what do we do to just stamp this out or begin the starting process where we can start to understand each other? What do you think we should do? Right. A song came to mind as you were talking, and it's an old song from Roger the Hammerstein musical, You've Got to Be Carefully Taught. Mm -hmm. We have been taught and educated to have a belief system that is ignorance, but we were told grandparents taught parents, taught children, and we just accepted blindly a falsehood. And the word that you used that absolutely speaks to my heart and speaks to unity's fifth principle was the word do. What do we do? I have often said talk is cheap. I can talk a good game, but those words don't change anything at any level. So I often say on Sunday morning, if the truth that we have explored and shared here in this sanctuary today stays in this sanctuary, it's been a waste of time. Mm -hmm. But if it goes out that doors and we act a little bit more kindly, a little more compassionately, we get into the state of doing, as Unity says, the truth that I know is the truth that I demonstrate, that I offer, and that means the courage the strength and the love to speak up where I see injustice, to speak up where I see hate, to speak up where subjugation of any kind to any person is happening, and then put my body in the line of fire as well. That means I need to be willing to stand alongside my gay, my black neighbor, my Asian neighbor, my Hispanic neighbor, to anybody who is being marginalized in any way, shape, or form, the doing means I put my hand up and I say, no longer. This doesn't happen in my field. This won't happen on my watch. And that's scary because when you speak up against that kind of hatred, you often become the person, the target, who's getting that hatred. And we must have the courage to do that. You said the fifth principle. Can you give us, what are the principles of Unity North? I'll give you, again, a Reader's Digest version. These are life-changing principles that could take years of study. There is only one power and one presence. There is only one God in the universe. We don't live in a universe that has a devil and God. The devil is a man-made construct made to try to understand why bad things are happening and shirk our own responsibility for why bad things are happening. So Unity principle number one, there's one presence, one power, and it's God. And that God and I are one. That is a spark of that divinity in all creation, in all people, black, white, brown, Muslim, Jewish. That's our second unity principle, is that the spark of the Christ, the Buddha, the Atman, the Tao, whatever you want to call it, there is a spiritual nature of perfection that exists at the core of Jackie Charles, Richard Burdick, and anybody who's watching right now. Mm -hmm. You're good. You were born good, not broken or stained. You were born good, and somewhere along the line, you forgot. So one power, one presence, that God and all creation are one. Therefore, I am responsible. I am created in the image and after the likeness of God, which means that I am a creative being. God is working through me as the vessel to manifest life. Our third principle is our thoughts, our feelings, and our faith is creating our reality. If we don't like what life is showing us, we need to shift our thinking. Stinking thinking created it, and more higher vibration thinking will be the remedy and the healing. We're not begging a God to make things better. We don't go to God beseeching, please make it better as if we're being punished. This is not the kind of God that unity teaches. So our third unity principle says you're responsible for your life. Change your thinking, change your life. 
at an individual level and a collective level. And so what's happening in the world today is a call to change our thinking. Racism is a call to confront our thinking that is out of congruity with spiritual truth. And how do we refine that ability to be one with God, our fourth unity principle, and that is prayer. Prayer is the foundation of everything that unity is about, prayer and meditation. Go to the stillness, go to the silence, remember who you are, remember who everybody is, and then quit the mouth for a while, put the ears on and listen, because that still small voice of God is speaking to you. And when you listen, suddenly things are revealed. There are epiphanies of truth that you couldn't see when you were just going through your human existence, doing what you've been taught to do. And of course, the fifth unity principle, out of our prayers, we get busy. We put feet to our prayers. We put hands to our prayers. We put bodies behind our prayers. That means service to humanity. That means don't just talk a good game, demonstrate the good game. Wow.